Hello, hello, my fellow art nerds, and welcome back to another Not Quite Speed Bane. Today, I'm shifting the workspace over to Medibang, and I'll be drawing some Victorian ghost kids for the spooky season of Halloween. <laughs> huge fan of horror and do horror artwork on the side, so when I was asked to do the Halloween videos here at Wing Canvas, my creative wheels immediately started turning. When I first think of ghosts, my first instinct was to draw some kids from the Victorian era who are still around because they suffered from an early fate. I'll talk more about that once we actually get to drawing the two of them, but for now, let's get arting. The first kid I designed was the little girl, who I named Estelle for no particular reason other than that I found the name pretty. I didn't have any real initial thoughts with her design beforehand, but as I sketched her out some more, I decided I wanted her design to kind of show that she passed from a water-related incident. That way, I could draw her as though her hair and dress are flowing around her permanently, as though she never left the water. So later on in the video, you'll see me trying to emulate water damage in her dress and add some barnacles and seaweed onto her design as well that I forgot to draw initially within her sketch. Um, these little details add to something called visual storytelling, where without seeing anything, you can kind of infer what's going on with the character based on how they look alone. Adding in that visual storytelling to your characters is a great way to make your character designs look a ton better and they read a lot better as well, because now you can see there's a bunch of extra thought that's been put into the character and their backstories viewers don't even need to read into at all. Like there's no there's no words, but they can see what's happening right in front of them, which makes your character designs go from like a 10 to like 11. The second kid I designed was this little boy who I named Robin, again for no particular reason other than that I really like that name. And Estelle already had a name, so I figured that the little boy should have a name as well. With the idea already in place that I wanted their designs to emulate what happened to them, I decided to design Robin as though he got lost in the woods and never found his way back out. So for the initial sketches I did of him, I already had in mind that I wanted Moss to be growing parts on parts of his clothes as if he's been sitting around for a while, but decided to also add some mushrooms here and there. Mushrooms only grow in dark, cool, and humid environments, so then he may have gotten lost not only in the woods, but in an undergrowth of some kind, maybe even a tree hollow. Um, so I also went out to the woods to gather some reference photos, I took a walk, you know, it felt nice to go out somewhere. But regardless, when you want to find inspiration, sometimes it's much better to go out, if you have access to it, um, to go out and actually take live photos for yourself, because then not only are you taking inspiration from the objects and the environment that you see around you, but you're starting to feel the mood of the environment, how it makes you feel, and that way you have like a first-hand experience with what you want to emulate, and that way you can really help trigger the emotional response better with your character designs. I also gave him a little lantern, showing that he was possibly exploring the woods at night, which wasn't a very smart thing to do, turns out, but he probably wouldn't know any better until it was too late. On the technical side of illustrating these, as I get into the line art, let me talk about my love for Medibang Paint Bros brushes. As someone who uses Photoshop mainly, Medibang Paint Bros pen brush handles so, so smoothly, and I absolutely adore it. Especially when drawing the eyes of the kids, I really took care into Estelle's long intense eyelashes, which are, which are very Tim Burton-esque, I realize after the fact, um, and the slight dark circles under Robin's eyes. Medibang's brush is super smooth and it handles these super small details very, very nicely. I tend to turn up my correction very, very high as well. Um, normally you'd want it to maybe like max 15. I have it at 25 just because I really like the lagged kind of feel. Uh, I didn't used to like it, but uh, as I used it more, I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is a lot nicer. Um, but it handles these super small details very, very nicely because of the correction, but also the brush itself is just very, very smooth. Uh, a lot of the times in Photoshop, I'll have to erase the ends of the lines I draw to get the proper thin tips so then they feel more like triangles, because if I just kind of leave it, it ends up looking a little bit messy and it gives it a look that I don't really like. But in this case, with Medibang's brushes, I don't have to do any of that since I know they'll taper out perfectly without any need for further interference. That's because of the correction that I've turned up as well. It doesn't really have the same effect if I leave it the correction at zero, but if I work with super, super high correction, then it tapers out like very, very nicely, gives that nice thin pointed tip to all the ends of my lines that I adore greatly. 
I also decided to line with the G brush this time around as well. Normally I'd use something like the pen brush or in Photoshop I'd normally use like the hard round or something. I'm a very default brush kind of person. I don't tend to use anything too fancy. I don't go seeking out brushes. Um, I'm because I'm totally cool with default brushes like there's nothing wrong with them so it's like you know it ain't broke but um, if I do need a different kind of brush I'll usually just make it myself um, because most digital programs have means of creating your own custom brushes and like it's not too hard to create so I just make them myself um, or if I do really really need a type of brush like I found a free star brush um, like to make like the look of a scattered galaxy then it's like I'll go search for that but most of the time I just stick with defaults because you know it's not the brushes that make the artwork it's the artist that makes the artwork so whatever you use um, it doesn't really matter too much uh, but I wanted something a little more textured this time around just for the visual effect it didn't hinder the illustration at all actually I think looking back on it now I don't really think you can tell that it's textured uh, when you zoom back out uh, but I personally think the rougher look fits the kids a little bit better considering they've passed a really long time ago um, the Victorian era was a really really long time ago so giving it that more traditional more textured rough look I think fits the character design just a little bit better than something as clean as like a hard round or the pen brush. When it came to picking the palettes, I decided to go with stuff that matched their themes. I, I guess you can call them themes. Uh, I gave Estelle a majorly analogous palette, ranging from blue to yellow. I figured that matching her palette to that of the beach or of a riverside would match her the best, all things considered. While Estelle's palette is derived from a yellow to blue analogous color scheme, I've muted a lot of those colors to give her more of an aged overall look. When I say muted, I mean more along the lines of turning down the saturation of the colors used and when I say saturation I mean how bright a color is. Say if you had a block of wood and a basketball. Both of these objects come from the color orange. However a basketball is a much brighter version of orange while the wood is a much more muted or duller version of orange. This is called saturation. When your colors are brighter and more pronounced they have higher saturation and when something is duller or more muted that's low saturation. So with Estelle's palette I have a more muted yellows a lot of the times because you know sand is usually derived from yellows and oranges so I muted that down because it is kind of just a lighter brown same with her hair and all that and you know kind of giving her that river ocean look I've muted the blues just a little bit um, just to give that nice almost like natural blue look um, later on you'll see me experiment with making her dress look as though it's water damage. Not too sure how well I did since I wasn't using a reference, <laughs> but that being said, please use reference when you're not certain how to draw something. You learn by taking in info from other images and seeing what they look like. That's how you learn. And please use reference of photos, not of other artwork, unless you're referencing a fictional thing. Even when you're working with cartoons or anime or whatnot, working with real photos allows you to find a 100% accurate source. If you reference off a drawing, there's a chance that it is not as accurate as you think it is. So it's better to reference off a photo and then work on stylizing it afterwards. And there is a difference between referencing and copying. When you are referencing, you are taking the image and learning how to draw off of it. You are not copying it to a T. So say if you have a reference photo and there's like a pose that you wanted to study off of, then you can take that pose and make it your own so there can be like a new character. Maybe you can stylize it a little bit. Um, that's called referencing. If you take that photo and you copy what is on that photo exactly, that is copying. And that's also another reason why you'd probably go better with either taking your own photos or not referencing off of other people's artwork. Especially because if you're referencing for a pose, then you could possibly be seen as if you are copying that person's artwork or their composition or whatever pose or idea that they had initially. So it is better to, you know, use photo reference. And if you have the tools available to you then it is probably better to make photo reference yourself as well like if you need to draw a hand you got two hands you can take photos of your own hands um, ask your friends for hands um, ask your friends if they can do some poses with you or you can take a photo of yourself doing certain poses that way it's your photo as well so you can't get sued um but make sure that when you are referencing things you are not copying and make sure that when you are referencing things you're being careful as so that you know you're not gonna get in trouble later on if you decide to reference off of something else that isn't yours 
For Robin's palette, I went with more earthy tones that adhered to some browns and greens with a hint of dark blue and violet for his shirt just to give him a little bit of a third color. But that being said, with the three major colors I use being brown, green, and violet, that makes his palette a more muted tricolor palette with the brown being the most prevalent, while green is the accent that adds the brights back in. Brown is generally a derivative of red or orange. The brown I use is closer to orange, thus the main three colors being used are orange, green, and purple. The main three secondary colors. Was that intentional? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, but I thought it would be fun to mention. Uh, what was intentional was picking the colors themselves, because since his quote-unquote theme dealt with more of the woods and getting lost within them, I figured an earthier overall palette made sense. I also gave his overall design that overgrown look as well, so he's been in the woods for a very long time. Tricolor palettes tend to be more playful palettes as well. You'll see a lot of the more popular tricolor palettes being red, blue, and yellow. Um, and you'll see those a lot in like Pixar, Disney, um, more childish things, um, just because they give a lot of a toyish feel, especially if all the colors are very, very saturated. But in design, a lot of the times when you're using tricolors, the other two colors, there will be one color that will be dominant and the other two colors will be a little bit more muted or a little bit more accented. Um, so then in that case, a lot of the times you'll see a lot of fantasy where they'll use tricolor, where they'll use tricolor palettes that will remain within the orange, green, and purple spectrum because it's very earthy. Um, it can be very whimsical. A lot of the times the accent color tends to be either green or purple. You won't see the orange quite as often because the orange tends to be a derivative of the browns um, that you might see around. But depending on the mix of the color that you use for tricolor palettes, you can get a lot of different very whimsical, very magical feels, which is kind of what I wanted to go for for Robin, even though I went with a bit of a more <laughs> sad and earthy kind of, um, kind of mood. There is a lot of different ways you can play around with the earthy tricolor palette. With that, that's the Ghost Kids Without Any Effects finished. That's right, this piece as a whole is not complete. I'll be saving the ghostifying for a separate video where I'll teach you all how to add some fancy transparency effects to the characters, as well as add some glows to make a character feel as though they're within a scene, rather than just being stuck onto a background. While this section technically came before the glows and transparencies, the effects video has already been released, so make sure that you check that one out if you haven't already. If you liked what you saw, make sure to leave a like on this video, comment down below to tell me what you'd like to see me draw next, and hit subscribe so that you never miss an upload. And hey, we art nerds gotta stick together, so join our little art community with the links down below. With that said, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye